This morning we'd like to have you turn with us to 1 Kings chapter 21 as we look at this case of Ahab, 1 Kings 21. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel right next to the palace of Ahab the king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of vegetables, because it is near to my house, and I will give to you a better vineyard than it, or, if you want, I will give to you the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And so Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give to you the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down on his bed and turned his face and would not eat bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sad that you are not eating bread? And he said, Because I spake to Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give to you my vineyard. I want Naboth's vineyard. Ahab was the king of Israel. He had a beautiful palace in the city of Samaria. If you go today to the ruins of the city of Samaria, the guides will point out the once luxurious palace of Ahab. The ruins are still there to the present day. He also had a palace in Jezreel. And there next to his palace in Jezreel was a vineyard that belonged to this man Naboth. As he looked at that vineyard, he thought, my, that would make a great vegetable garden. So close to my palace here and so convenient. I want that for my vegetable garden. So he contacted Naboth and he said, hey, I'd like your vineyard and if You want, I'll trade you even a better vineyard than that for it. Or, I'll pay you whatever it's worth. Naboth said, I inherited this from my father, and he from his father. And it's a family inheritance. I I just am not interested in selling it. I won't get rid of the family inheritance. And this made King Ahab so upset. He went home, went into his bedroom, just laid down on the bed with his face to the wall, sulking and pouting and wouldn't even eat. Until his wife came in and said, Honey, what's your problem? He said, I want Naboth's vineyard. Of course, being the wicked woman that she was, she said, Well, that's no problem. I'll arrange that. You just give to me your signet ring." And so she sent out letters in the name of King Ahab. Letters unto men saying, Let's call a feast in the city. Set Naboth in a seat of prominence. And while the people are gathered there, have two men perjure themselves, declaring that they've heard him blaspheming God and saying evil against the king. And then, when these accusations are made, incite the people to stone Naboth that he might die. The wishes of Jezebel were carried out. Naboth was stoned to death under the false charges. And she came in and said, Honey, you can go out and take your vineyard now. Naboth is dead. Covetousness 
is a craving or a longing for something that belongs to someone else with the thought that I must have that. That strong desire, craving to possess that which is not yours, that which rightfully belongs to someone else. There's a vast difference between admiring and coveting. I can admire what you have. I can say, my, that's great. That's really beautiful. I'm glad that you have that. No problem with that. But when I start coveting, thinking, my, I wish I had that instead of him. And I begin to crave that which belongs to someone else. I am guilty of one of the worst sins in the Bible. Under the law, God forbid the people to covet, or he forbade them to covet. The law said that they were not to covet their neighbor's wife, their neighbor's house, or servant, or ox, or anything that belonged to their neighbor. For a long time, people in reading the law did not recognize that in the forbidding of coveting, God was actually declaring and showing that the law was spiritual. You see, man had come to interpret the law in a purely physical realm, in a physical way. He had interpreted the law as far as the actions of a person. But the law was intended to regulate the attitudes of a person. Jesus graphically illustrated this in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, You have heard that it hath been said of those by those of old time that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever kills will be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you're in danger of the judgment. You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoever looks upon a woman and lusts after her in his heart, he's guilty. But that's not the way they were interpreting the law. They interpreted the law that you were only guilty when you took the action. You could lust all you want. You could hate all you want. They could have all of these inner things just as long as it didn't work itself out in an outward action, you were okay. And thus they were smugly thinking, well, I'm a very righteous man because I have never murdered anybody. Though they had harbored hatred and wished they could kill. Now, Jesus said that when God gave the law, he was talking about attitude. He was forbidding the hatred which brings murder. But they didn't recognize that. But Paul, being a Pharisee, living as a Pharisee in the earlier years of his life, writing, said, as concerning the righteousness which was of the law, I was blameless. Hey, I had not done any of those evil things. But one day as Paul was reading again the law, he read the words, Thou shalt not covet. And he realized that that was talking about an inward attitude. A longing or a craving for that which belonged to another person. And Paul said, when that hit me, when I realized the law said, Thou shalt not covet, then I realized I was a sinner and the law had condemned me to death. Now, the law was not written that you can read it and feel righteous. The law was written 
in order that you might feel guilty before God and come to God's provision for your guilt, which is Jesus Christ. And if you are interpreting the law in such a way as you can look at it and feel smug and think, well, I'm pretty righteous, I've never done any of these things, then you're interpreting the law wrongly. For a proper interpretation of the law will make you sense your guilt before God and it will drive you to Jesus Christ wherein is your only hope for salvation. As Paul said, the law was a schoolmaster intended to drive us to Jesus Christ because of the sense of guilt that it creates when we realize that it deals with the spiritual attitudes of my heart. Now the Bible tells us that covetousness is idolatry. That is, it is the worship of something, the desire of something, that something becomes really the central thing. And when you really start to covet, it it so absorbs your heart and your mind and your life that you feel, I can't go on without it. I must have it, you know. And and your waking hours are just absorbed in, in scheming and figuring out how I can somehow get this. And covetous becomes a horrible sin. Though we are prone to sort of classify sins in a different way. Much like the Catholics, we sort of look at some as sort of mortal and others as venial. That's not so bad. Oh, that's horrible. If, if someone comes and reports that one of the uh, men of the church has been caught up in an adulterous affair, we all go to the Lord and we pray, oh God, you know, deliver him, help him, Lord. And, and we really get, you know, concerned in prayer. But if someone should come and report that one of the men of the church was coveting his neighbor's Mercedes, we would sort of say, <laughs> isn't that something? Don't we all sort of covet, you know? <laughs> and, and we're not so prone to think of it as, as a horrible sin. We, we're sort of just to pass that off, you know, well, as long as he doesn't steal it, I guess he's okay, you know. <laughs> but the Bible really condemns the desiring of it. And when Jesus talks about guarding our heart with all diligence, for out of the heart come the issues of life. He tells us that out of the heart comes adultery and fornication and murder and covetousness and thefts. Look at the list that Jesus places covetousness in. He places it right alongside of fornication and murder and adultery and thievery. When Paul talks about how the world is guilty before God in Romans chapter 1 and tells of the, of the horrible mess that the world is in because people are guilty, he declares, of murder, of fornication, of adultery, of wickedness, of covetousness, of maliciousness. He puts it right in line with all of these other things. So where we are prone to have, you know, on a ratio of 1 to 10, murder and rape and so forth being in the 10 category, we would sort of be prone to put covetousness maybe up in number 1 category. Not so bad. But the Bible lists them together. And the Bible tells us, though we keep the whole law, if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. The Bible says, cursed is the man who continues not in the whole law to do the things that are written therein. So you that are sitting back in your self-righteous smugness saying, well, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. I've never committed adultery and so forth. Wait a minute. Have you ever desired something that belonged to someone? Oh, well, yeah, but, you know. Uh, Well, the law said thou shalt not covet. 
thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's car, of course, a chariot or horse or ox or whatever. Anything that belongs to your neighbor, that encompasses quite a bit, doesn't it? And if you've offended in one point of the law, you're guilty of all. So we are all guilty before God. We are all in need of Jesus Christ and that salvation that he has provided through his death upon the cross. You see, coveting is really at the root of most sins. Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard. Because he coveted the vineyard, he allowed Naboth to be condemned under perjury, He allowed Naboth to be stoned to death. And then he stole Naboth's vineyard. He appropriated it when he was killed. And so lying, murder, stealing came out of the coveting of Naboth's field. James tells us that a man, when he is tempted, should not say that God had really tempted me today because he said God doesn't tempt men with evil. But a man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires or by covetousness or lust. And this lust, when it is conceived, produces sin in some of its grossest forms. Desiring my neighbor's wife could lead me to adultery and even to murder, even as it did with David, the king of Israel. He saw Bathsheba He coveted her. He craved or lusted after her. And so he sent that she should come to his palace. And there he had an adulterous relationship with her and later had her husband murdered so that he could marry her. But David is not alone in his guilt. Coveting can lead to such horrible sins. Now, God would stop the sin in its bud, in its beginnings. And that is why God said, Thou shalt not covet. Sometimes we think that we can sort of play with these things, though, and not get burned. We think, well, just a little bit of indulgence or, you know, just giving a little bit to my desires. I can, I can control it. I, I don't, uh, uh, I won't go all the way. I have a great craving for peanuts. I covet them. (laughs) And sometimes when my wife sends me to the store for milk, (laughs) I don't go directly to the dairy counter, but I go past, I go down the row where the peanuts are. And I stop and I look at those planters' unsalted peanuts, and I say, I have victory over you. (laughs) I don't need you. (laughs) 
And just to show you I have victory over you, I'm going to walk right past you and not even take you off the shelf. And I go to the milk counter feeling triumphant and I get the milk. But rather than going directly to the check stand, <laughs> I come back by in order that I might just gloat in my victory over those peanuts. And I say, I have victory over you. Just to prove to you how much victory I have, I'm going to hold you in my hand and just look at you. <laughs> and as I'm holding the peanuts in my hand, I say, I have complete victory, and to prove it, I'm going to buy you, <laughs> but not eat you. You can just sit on my shelf at home. So I check out with the milk and peanuts. <laughs> and when I get home, I look at that jar of peanuts and say, I got victory over you. And to prove the victory I have over you, I'm only going to eat one. And after the jar is gone, I feel horrible, I feel guilty, I feel miserable. How could I have eaten that whole jar of peanuts? We feel sometimes that we can just play around, though, you know, with, with the temptation, the desire. But God wants it stopped. And God said, Thou shalt not covet. Living in our age, the attitude, as long as you don't do it, you're all right. But according to the Bible, the desire, that strong desire given into allowing it to remain, you're guilty. Jesus pointed out that it was the thought process that leads us to the sin. And that is where God is interested in stopping the whole thing, to get it stopped before it can get started, to get it stopped in the thought processes before it has the chance to develop any further. The Bible tells us that whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It's talking about what you plant in your brain. And if you allow in your mind, your brain, to dwell upon certain things, the coveting, the desiring, the strong desire. Say, for instance, pornographic magazines. If you have the tendency to just pick them up and just say, well, I just, you know, leaf through and look at the pictures. Or if you're guilty of renting the X-rated or R-rated videos or going to the movies with those X and R-rated films. You are planting into your mind the desire, the lust. And it is going to work itself out in fornication or in adultery or in other forms of sexual perversion. And so the Bible would stop the thing in the beginning. Don't plant that into your mind. Because if you plant these things in, garbage in, it'll be garbage out. Your mind is like a computer. The Bible says keep your heart, your mind with all diligence. Put a guard over the gate, a filter. For if we of the flesh do, if we reap, or actually if we sow to the flesh, that fleshly side of our nature, then of our flesh we're going to reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, then of the Spirit we will reap life everlasting. And so how important that we bring into our mind things of the Spirit, the Word of God, good spiritual music. 
Because if you allow that junk of the world to be planted in your mind, the music of the world or whatever, it's going to corrupt you. It's going to work its way out in this horrible list of things that the Bible describes as the works of the flesh which are manifest in all of these horrible, ugly things. But it all begins with the coveting. That strong desire. And that's why God in the law forbid, forbade the coveting. Coveting is not only the root of many sins, horrible sins, it is sin itself, but it is also the root of unhappiness. Look at Ahab. He's lying on his bed. His face is to the wall. He's sulking. He's pouting. He's miserable. His wife comes in and says, What's wrong with you? Why are you so sad? I want Naboth's vineyard. I mean, he's miserable. This coveting has just got him in a state of abject misery. I don't want to eat. I don't want to sleep. I don't want to live. If I can't have that vineyard, I want to die. And the horrible thing that coveting will do brings you such misery, such torment. Now he had plenty to be satisfied with. Couple of opulent palaces. Hundreds of servants to keep things up. Vineyards, lands, fields. He had it all. But when he began to covet his neighbor's vineyard, all that he had seemed meaningless and nothing. I'm miserable. I can't live unless I have it. You know, the world in which we live is a rugged, rough place to live. My little grandson, when he was up at our house and didn't want to go home, we said, well, well, you, you got to go home, honey. And he said, but Grandpa, it's rough living at home. Well, it's just rough living in this world. <laughs> because the whole advertising purposes are to create covetous, covetousness in your heart. To make you feel, I have to have that. I can't live without that. I'm miserable. Honey, if you really love me, you'd buy that for me, you know. And, and that whole miserable scene, because I've got to have it, you know. And, and you pick up magazines, you, you see the billboards. They're all designed to create a discontentment in your heart with your present state so that you'll be willing to go into hawk in order to get the product which is supposedly going to bring you great satisfaction and happiness. Now you're really living. Naboth had everything a man could desire. But when he allowed that coveting of his neighbor's vineyard to take over his life, he was in misery. If you once give in to coveting, there is no end to the toys that you're going to desire. You're going to always want more. And the man with the most toys is often the most unhappy man of all. For he is never contented. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, Beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. There's a whole fallacy to covetousness. The fallacy is if I just have that, I'll be happy. 
And so a man adds one toy to another, to another, to another, always with the idea that the next toy is going to make me happy. It's going to bring me contentment. I'll be satisfied. But the, the truth of the matter is you won't find satisfaction in things. You won't find happiness in things. Satisfaction and happiness can only be found in a right relationship with God. And it is not until your heart is right with God that you are really a happy, satisfied person. The story is told of a king of India who had a son who was very unhappy. And he bought his son all kinds of trinkets and toys to make him happy. But the little boy just sat there every day with a sour face looking sad. And so the king called in the wise men and the sages and each of them suggested, well, if he just had this, he would be happy. And so the king would buy him a new pony and he'd buy him a silver saddle and he would buy him all of these things. But still, the little boy just sat in sadness and sorrow. And one day the king found a wise old sage who said to him, If your son will just wear the shirt of a truly happy man, he will be happy. And so the king instituted a search throughout the kingdom to find a truly happy man. And in a remote village, they finally found a man who was truly happy. But alas, he was so poor, he didn't even own a shirt. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. What would it profit you if you possessed the whole world, but lost your own soul? Life isn't in things. It isn't in trinkets. It isn't in the baubles of the world, but life is in a relationship with God made possible only through Jesus Christ. And when you have that, you have a peace that passes human understanding. You have a fulfillment, a contentment, a happiness that no amount of worldly trinkets can bring. There's only one thing in the Bible that I can think of that we are told to covet. And at the end of chapter 12 in Corinthians, Paul said, but covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit. If we are to covet then we should be coveting, desiring, craving a closer relationship with God. The power of God's Spirit working freely and fully in my life. These are the things that will bring joy unspeakable, a joy that is full of glory. These are the things that will bring contentment and happiness and fulfillment. When I'm walking with God in this close, beautiful relationship, and so I desire and I crave after that walk with God. David said, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I have this craving, I have this coveting to just be with God. And if you have that coveting, then you are truly a happy person. Because as you walk with God, there is a sense of the eternal that makes everything in this world appear what it really is, nothing. Emptiness sham for the reality is in the things of the spirit walking with God 
God help us that knowing that man is prone to covet, that will covet the right things. We'll begin to have a craving and a longing for God for a closer walk with him. Shall we pray? Father, create in us a heart after thee. after the things of the Spirit, that we might know that joy and contentment, Lord, of living in fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, love not, or John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He that hath the love of the world in his heart hath not the love of the Father. If you find yourself coveting after the things of the world, then it is a sin that must be confessed and repented of. If it is not confessed and repented of, it's going to lead you into worse sins. It's not something that you can just pass off and tee-hee about and kid about and just say, aren't I naughty? I covet, you know, my neighbor's car. Not so. It is a sin that must be forsaken, repented of, confessed, and gotten rid of. Because it can drag you down. It can destroy. May the Lord speak to our hearts and show us those areas of our own heart. And may we keep our hearts with all diligence. Knowing that our life does not consist of the abundance of things we possess. Our life really consists of a right relationship with God. That's where it is. And may we seek that above all else. And seek him above all else. In Jesus' name.